Hey everybody, this is Kathy. Welcome back to another live stream from Synapse Care Solutions. We are continuing with week three of our IVH prevention and care series. And we are excited this week to have Deidre Teal, a nurse practitioner from Ohio. And she's gonna share with you a QI project that she and her team created called the Baby Steps Program. The steps are five steps that you can do to reduce IVH in your NICU. Can you guess what those are? If not, you wanna stay tuned to Deidre's presentation. If you would like to get her slides or any other resources that are related to this month's series, like watching the other replays, getting some of the articles, go ahead and either scan the QR code on this screen or click the link in the show notes below and we will send you those right away. And if you haven't already, please click the like and subscribe button right here on YouTube. It tells YouTube that you like videos like this and helps us bring more free content to you. So without further ado, please enjoy this presentation from Deidre Teal and I'll see you at the end. Thank Thank you, Kathy. Thank you for having me today. I'm so happy to be with the One community. I'd like to start off and just ask if you guys have IVH bundles, prevention bundles in your unit. Just like wave or chat and say yes. I'm just very curious. I see one. We've got some nods. Okay, so this is new for us and obviously I'll tell you about our development of the project. So we all know um, the background of IVH and to just go into a little bit of it, we know that it occurs occurs in up to a quarter of our extremely low birth weight infants, um, and that the highest risk is in the first 72 hours where about 90% of them are found. And there are significant long-term neurological sequelae that are associated, including the developmental delays, hydrocephalus, or cerebral palsy, and these are all things that are, we're working to prevent. So the purpose of our project, it was actually started by one of our residents and neonatologists. And I was fortunate enough to be um, accepted into the ELF, which is the Emerging Leader Program, and that's through NAN and Sonova. And I was fortunate to be asked to be part of the ELF program, and that's where I met Kathy. And my passion was small babies, so I wanted to do something in our small baby population. And this project was already started with our resident and one of the directors. So I jumped right in, very passionate about this population. And here's where we found that our rates of IVH have been consistently high, up to about 15.8%. And our national average is about 7 to 8%. And those numbers are from 2013 to 2018. So we recognize that there was a great need for this project. And our purpose statement and our goal was to reduce the severe IVH, so those grade threes, grade fours, and PVL in infants less than 28 weeks gestation to 10% or less within the first year of the project, and then to national average within two years. And if we can get even below, that would be absolutely phenomenal. And by creating these guidelines, we really hope to standardize our interdisciplinary approach to our extremely low birth weight infants. So here's our baseline data from 2013 to 2018, where you can see there's several years where we are much above the national average. And these numbers reflect infants that are less than 1,500 according to the Vaughn criteria. Our project's a little more focused on infants less than 28 weeks gestation. That's just to maintain consistency with some other projects that are going on in our unit. We do have a large BPD prevention QI project that's also looking at this population. And just to mention our 2019 rates, they were lower than what we see here. So we had about 10 infants out of 161, less than 1,500 grams or that had severe IVH. So that's about 6%, which is much lower. And then under the 28, it was about 16%. So we had 10 out of the 63. And then to talk about our core team, so we had our neonatologist involved. She is actually the medical director for the unit. And then the resident, who is now one of our chief residents, we had two champion RNs and then myself as the nurse practitioner. And then throughout making up the guidelines, the development, we were getting input from radiology, from our neonatal therapist, from a lot of the bedside RNs, charge nurses, and then radiology as well. And so we developed several components for the project. We revised our golden, golden hour worksheet, so it's more specific for infants less than 28 weeks gestation. And then we made a, a nursing bedside checklist, an educational PowerPoint, and then the guidelines. So here's what our golden hour worksheet looks like. So it's revised to highlight specific admission needs for these babies. There's a section that emphasizes practices during admission, like trying to reduce the noise as well as the sounds. 
keeping midline and keeping the head of the bed elevated. And then the backside includes some documentation organization. I'm not sure about your facility, but sometimes it takes ours a little while to get our babies admitted. So it helps keeping those things in order. And then here is the example of the bedside checklist. It's double-sided. Um, this was actually adapted from the one that was used at Chom Thomas Jefferson Memorial Hospital um, through an IVH prevention project that was done by Jill Beck. And we just love this checklist so much um, that we were able to use it for ours. And they've had incredible results from their project and we're really hoping to mirror that. So the front side covers the first 72 hours. Um, it goes through a lot of the the care points within the guidelines. Um, and then there's check boxes and nursing initials. Um, and then the back is day four to seven. So just to help keep everybody on the same page um, and help track compliance. And so we're seeing that these are completed almost completely through the first week. Sometimes there's some shifts that are missing. And then it's very helpful because the nurses will put some little side notes about, oh, the baby got a bolus here, or for rationales why some things weren't able to be completed. So Deidre, on that checklist, sorry to interrupt your flow there, but do you have a team that goes through daily and rounds and audits on these checklists, or do you just collect them as part of the QI at the end and then maybe you'll implement that later? That's a good question. So it's either myself or the resident will go through while the babies are here for seven days. If for some reason I'm out for a week or Cynthia is out, then we'll just collect them at the end or maybe the one of the nurses will jump in and go through it. So it's either during it or after. So we'll see, we'll check in both places. Okay. And then here's the educational PowerPoint, just an example for we created content on the background. And then we went through the risk factors of IVH. We reviewed our purpose and our goal, given our high rates. And then we went into each of the five components of the guidelines and we gave a fact sheet as well as a rationale for every intervention that we listed. And here's an example from the temperature slide. The first one is maintaining the thermal wrap, wrapped until the isolate is closed and the baby and the isolate are at NTE. And the rationale for that is to avoid the hypothermia or the cold stress because we know that is associated with IVH. And then here are the guidelines. So you have stress, temperature, environment, positioning, and skin. So we have the guidelines set to the left of the isolate on the cabinet so they're easily visible. And then the small sign that you see on the right is placed on the isolate and it'll go right above the doors. And that's just to remind ourselves that every time we're going in and out of the isolate that every touch matters for these babies, especially in the first week of life. So when we're talking about stress, we know that our patients endure a staggering amount of painful procedures throughout their NICU stay. And many of them are within the first week due to their acuity. And so our principle for this is to reduce those painful procedures that ultimately change brain pathways and brain development. So things like advocating for umbilical lines to reduce the number of painful heel sticks. In addition, we want to reduce cerebral blood flow fluctuations and highlight the importance of slow fluid administration and retrieval. When we're talking about temperature, we know that hypothermia is independently associated with IVH. And so we wanna take precautions to ensure our babies are normal thermic and with appropriate humidity. In regards to environment, our goal is to reduce noxious stimuli, so those bright lights, those loud sounds, and then to decrease handling. So one major change for us was that we moved our care from every three hours, we were doing full hands-on, to every six hours. And in addition, we're encouraging kangaroo care because we know that has many shown and proven benefits to our babies. For positioning, the focus is on reducing and lowering that intracranial pressure by elevating the head of the bed. We want to reduce blood flow fluctuations, reduce venous congestion by maintaining that midline position. And we were able to work with our radiology department to ensure that keeping the head of the bed elevated for seven days would not affect the tube placement especially. And they were able to run some tests for us and noted that there was an insignificant percentage of discrepancy shown. So we were able to move forward with maintaining the head of the bed 15 degrees at all times. And then in regards to skin, we highlighted the importance of maintaining integrity because if we're not able to maintain integrity and we have breakdown, 
we know that can negatively affect temperature and create pain and stress for these patients. So as far as tracking, um, it's, with the compliance, there were several things that we looked at. And so one of them is the chart reviews. So we're tracking our primary outcomes as far as the severe IVH and looking at all the head ultrasounds, but we're also looking at, did they have lines and how many days they had the lines? Did they get kangaroo care? Did they have boluses or blood and how long those ran over? And we'll be reviewing the checklist so that'll either be done daily if we're in-house or at the end, we'll go through it and that helps us to see what was and wasn't completed. And then we're doing positioning audits. So either com completed by myself or our resident or the two champion nurses. And so our goal is to get at least two of them within the first week that they're here. And then we are seeing consistent environmental and positional compliance. So those lights are dim when we go in there, the rooms are quiet, the babies are able to be midline and that those eye shields are in place. And then we're reviewing our outcomes on a quarterly basis. So we did start in about the middle of quarter three, and we've had five patients that have been enrolled into our bundle and initiative. And within those five patients, there was one baby that had a questionable grade two, grade three, and they did decide to call it a grade three. But so far that's been our only severe IVH in um, the two months that we've been going on with this project. So we're very proud of all the work that our unit has done for this, and we're looking forward um, to continuing. And some of the findings that we are seeing from all of the development and implement, implementation of the project, there were a few barriers. So obviously COVID-19, and we had pretty much been ready to roll out at the end of February, March, and we decided to hold off and delay rolling that out just because we did not want to overwhelm staff and bring on a whole new project with everything going on and all the daily changes. So we ended up pushing back and we started educating in September and then we began tracking August 1st. And another barrier was the education itself. So it was a little difficult because as much as I wanted to, it's, it was difficult for me to teach 150 nurses by myself and we don't get a lot of time out of clinical. So I was very fortunate to work with our educator and a group of 14 central line nurses who've all become great leaders in our unit. And they were able to educate the staff during their monthly education sessions. So they take 15, 30 minutes once a month and go through new topics every month. And they were able to teach about the bundle within those sessions. And then another barrier for us and the implementation is that currently we have our CLAPC and VAP bundles. And at this time, we're not able to change them so that they can reflect our goal of decreasing handling. So right now we're still bathing and doing daily linen changes starting from day one on all of our patients. And so I'm hoping in the next um, couple cycle, cycles we're able to revisit that and decrease the amount of handling we're doing within the first week. And so our greatest opportunity here, we feel, is to create and form a comprehensive interdisciplinary team to where we can create a full small baby protocol. There's a lot of questions that I've gotten asked, especially regarding skin and positioning and developmental care and things that we weren't able to address in the IVH bundle that would be great in a more comprehensive document. And so just to touch on why we think this project is significant, and we know that every interaction that we have on this population is impactful, especially in the first few days, especially in the first week. And so with this project, we have an opportunity to contribute to a growing body of knowledge that does support these neuroprotective interventions with that long-term goal of reducing severe IVH and long-term sequelae that are associated. And so I'd like to acknowledge um, the ELF directors, Paula Webb and Kathy Bush, and then my wonderful ELF mentor, Kathy Sally Randall, and all of the Rainbow colleagues that have put so much time into this project, including Mary Knox, Cynthia Moffitt, Tina Anzo, and Hillary Greenlee. And below are the references, and I'm happy to share questions you guys have. <laughs> I think there have been a couple questions that people are putting in the chat area, so maybe we can use those as a beginning, or if anybody has any burning questions they want to ask Deidre, just go ahead and just unmute. I see one from Amanda that says, do you allow kangaroo care from day one? And right now we are waiting until after 72 hours of life. Although recently I believe there's some data showing that it might be safe earlier, so that's something that we are willing to look at as well. 
to have small babies in private rooms. And yes, almost all of our rooms are private. We do have a couple twin and triplet rooms. And that's just already your existing. Yeah. And we don't have a small baby region either dedicated for nurses that take care of that small baby population. For us, everybody takes care of everybody and it's, there's no would specific you, location. Would you talk a little bit about your population there at Rainbow Babies? Do you have an inborn population? Are they transport only? What percentage of your total annual admissions are these smaller babies? Most of our babies are inborn. We don't typically get transfers of little babies until they're older and are needing other consults from other mm -hmm. hospitals. So most of our babies are inborn. And as far as the total population for ours, I'm not sure, but I believe our rate for admissions for the year is around 13, 1200, 1300. Mm -hmm. And what I'm seeing is around 150 to 200 for the, the babies less than 1500. So about the kind of normal average kind of population average too. And how about head of bed up during a chest x-ray? What's your practical? tips on that, Deidre or anybody else? How are you guys balancing? So that was one of the things that we had a bit of a hurdle on. Previously, we had been lowering the bed and then elevating it after the chest x-ray or whatever x-ray we need. Mm -hmm. We did have to go through our radiology department and they were wonderful and did some tests with us. And then they did found that it wasn't significant enough to prevent us from doing that. So right now we're just doing 15 degrees all around for the first seven days. So even during the x-ray? Even during x-rays. How about vitamin A? Are you using that as part of your regimen? We do use vitamin A and we do it for 12 doses, three times a week. And right now we think the benefits are outweighing the painful procedure right now. And that's something that we are also in discussion about. Is anybody doing research on that? The last research is pretty weak on vitamin A. So I was just wondering if anybody else is looking at that. You need a lot of babies to treat before you have any good outcomes from it. And it seems like a lot of shots and a lot of pain and it's expensive. Yeah. Here in Kansas City, we just had our big consensus group come together, look at all of the data and put it forth to all the neonatologists and the team. And they've chosen to continue at this time reading that. So Jackie, summarize yeah. that again. Yeah, to address the question of research and support for this, we went through an extensive uh, consensus process in our unit and our small baby group, and every neonatologist and nurse practitioner and the small baby team looked at everything, and actually they voted to continue uh, regardless. Just like you said, the benefit of reducing BPD perhaps is better than the potential painful downfall. Yeah. Are you guys doing research on it or is it, are any of the big centers that you guys know of doing, looking at this again, just to prove if there is benefit? I'm sure that's probably going to be something on the forefront with our new research tower that's going up and our BPD prevention work, uh, but nothing I know of at this point. Same. I'm not aware of any that are currently ongoing right now. And we are not working on it. So Jackie, you were also saying you use Z-Flow to help with the position and you're x-raying right through it? Yes. Actually, this was a small quality improvement project because our radiologists were totally against it. And we started not moving the babies for the 72 hours, so no weights or anything like that. But Z-Flows were the standard positioning agent that we used for these patients. And basically just making sure that the Z-Flow, the bubbles are smoothed out. And now it's standard practice, no problem at all. Great. Have you guys done any case studies on that, Jackie, to publish? I actually can, we're having a meeting later today. I can actually bring that up. There's a lot of other positioning agents out there. What's better, what's best, and yes. it's consistency. So that's what they chose to do. Yeah, I just think if you've done the work in the quality improvement way and you got some buy-in from your radiologist, I think it's just helpful to other people who like that tool to know that and to know that even if it is a white paper that's done by you or a small case study that you put in neonatology today, which is more peer reviewed, those little just anecdotal saves everybody else time. It's, oh, I thought we couldn't, or they've heard we couldn't, or I, I think it'd be great. I will definitely uh, 
pose that challenge to the people because there's so much QI work that goes on everywhere. Yeah. Um, but small projects really make a difference, I think. No, and absolutely. I really appreciate what was being said uh, about the work that you've done with the small baby population and IVH bundle. I really appreciate that. So thank you for your presentation. There's a question about colostrum care during that first 72 hours. Where would that maybe fit or what are you guys doing for that? For your population. Right? So we are still doing colostrum care and we're still doing the oral care part of the VAP and that's every three to four hours. So we are still continuing that at this time. So it's more under the VAP bundle versus mm -hmm. kind of this bundle, mm -hmm. which is why just when there's so much overlap where the comprehensive plan would make sense. Great question. Barbara's asking about are you using electrodes and we found one infant had skin issues. Um, that our exhibitor in UAC gave us all the information we really needed versus leads. So have you guys had that under your skin area? Talk about that part. Yeah, so at this time we're still using electrodes on everybody unless there's significant skin issues as well as um, pulse axes and bridging for lines. We use the duoderm, but this is very case by case and we have had some issues with any or all three of those. And so those are the babies that we just have to be very cognizant of and adapt what we're doing as far as for what's safe for the baby. So we do try to keep the electrodes on and the pulse sacs and the bridges because those are very important, especially the bridging for those lines, but it, it is infant based and every baby's different. So there was a question about which positioning aids you guys are currently using and then to talk a little bit more about the turtle head midliner. Sure. So the positioning aids, we will use dandelroos. We love those. We do have Z flows, but we do, do we remove them for the x-rays. So we try to be um, careful when we're using those and try to plan it around the x-rays and such. And we have Telfa to put on top of those to help with the skin. And then the tortal midliners, right now we're using those once they get up to the unit, they're not placed in the delivery room right now. And we even had our tortal representative come out from the company and do a wonderful presentation to all the nurses about reminding them how to position and how to place the turtle in the best way and how to use it so that you can place them midline even on their side and just making sure everything is aligned and um, that was very well received i think it was really important to have him come out and do another presentation i think people responded really well to that cool so Carolyn, you were saying that you guys tried the turtles too, but they were more cumbersome and that you just switched back to your dandelroos. I could see that, especially with when they're on the oscillator and you're having to be very cognizant of how you're positioning them. I've heard sometimes that the turtles can be a little cumbersome. And again, each baby is different. So if we have to do what's best for the baby, we try to use the turtles as much as we can to help keep them in line positioning. But if we have to adjust, we'll be, we will. And then there is some, just a couple, just clarifying questions about daily weights and daily baths. Are you doing them? And then uh, maybe why? So the one thing we changed was daily weights. We are no longer doing those until after 72 hours, just to minimize handling. And sometimes we were even doing them twice a day to catch their fluid and electrolyte issues. But so far that has been well received and we're not finding issues. So we're continuing to do daily weights after the third day. And then the daily baths and linen changes is out of a Clabsy bundle. And that's been put in place in the last few years. So they do get sterile water baths in the evening and complete linen changes. And right now we're not able to change that part of the bundle, but it is in discussion and something that I would like to see decrease so we can hopefully decrease the handling. Mm -hmm. And and for the linens, do you just make their bed with five layers so you can just do a quick lift and pull or what's the policy? Uh, there's not really a policy for that and some people will do it that way, but most importantly taking out that first layer that they've been on. We don't really have a policy on that right now. But you don't have to change your dandel roos daily. We should be and the frogs as well. So that's part of the policy, it is. Yes. is changing yep. those two. Wow, anybody else doing that? 
changing out all of those positioning aids every 24? We do that <laughs> for central lines. If the baby has a central line, then they get a full linen change, including their positioning aids. Even for the little guys in the beginning, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We don't have inborns right now, so that when we get little guys, it's usually after they've gotten a bad bleed. But. Jackie or Carolyn, do you guys have any policies around that? So for, we have a standardized bathing in our pediatric, it's PF, pediatric hospital, for our preterm babies just every other day, and that includes the linen change unless there's some untoward thing that happens. Mm -hmm. And for full-term babies, it's every day, linen changes. Some of the other things that occur, like changing the isolate every two weeks, the entire, everything gets changed mm -hmm. out. And after they come off humidity, the, it, the bed gets changed out. And we've tried to standardize that across the board and that's helped. Um, but it takes a team and that's why I was asking about the private room situation and how you have the hands that you require for doing all of those things. Yeah. You mean especially for the two-person cares and then these kind of linen changes and all and, that. And the bigger procedures and, yeah. and coming out of the isolates for kangaroo, which we do also, but it's a team effort to do mm -hmm. so. Yeah. yeah. Carolyn, did, did you have something you were going to add? I was just going to say, we also change our isolates every two weeks. The dandaroos, we just change the pillow covers, probably fairly frequently because they're always getting dirty. Mm -hmm. And then the whole dandaroo itself, just when it's necessary. We don't have any standard for like how often we change linens. I think they get changed pretty frequently. And then we just tr try to avoid stress. We try to change the linens and the isolates and everything when they're being, when they're kangarooing or when they're being held or whatever. Yeah, um, thank, yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. I'm sorry I didn't say that. That We take every opportunity to do those kinds of mm -hmm. things. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a great idea. And the daily baths for your little ones, Deidre, you said sterile water. And then what's your cutoff date for that then? I want to say seven days, but I, I would have to double check on that. And then when do you switch to daily CHG at some point if they still have lines? No, most of our guidelines for CHG are, aren't until they're like two months corrected. Yeah. Great. Anybody else? I know this, uh, this comes up a lot, this daily bathing yeah. with CHG, especially for those of you in children's hospitals. Yeah, we, we wait till their skin matures. They have to be at least two weeks old or 32 weeks, greater than 32 weeks. We don't use CHG at all in the NICU. I don't know if that's going to change, but it's been like that forever. Even our pediatric, even our PICU, I think the, is it two months or mm -hmm. something? They, mm -hmm. We don't use it on anybody under two months. Right. And we don't, yeah, we certainly changing. don't do daily baths. I think we just do Sally wipe here and there or some sterile water as needed, but we don't do sterile baths. We don't do daily baths at, at this point anyways. Janet, you're saying you too? Yeah, we don't use uh, CHG on babies under two months, either at Loma Linda or here at Riverside. And then for line, like for central lines, you're just using betadine? Betadine on the small babies and then mm -hmm. CHG uh, if they're bigger, but not bathing with it. Yeah. Yeah. To clarify, we don't use it for bathing either. Sorry. Let's see. Lori saying, I'm trying to figure out... How good research is done when facilities vary so much. Amen <laughs> to that. Yeah. We don't use CHG for baths, just for needle pokes. So for, Natalie's asking limitations for kangaroo care around local lines, humidity. So what's your best advice on that part? Any of you and all of you, Deidre, who, what are you guys all doing? I feel like kangaroo care is very, very beneficial to our patients. So we try to promote that. As far as umbilical lines, we have vias, and so they are little machines that help prevent taking blood away from the baby. So those are our biggest limitation on our small babies if they have a, a UAC in place where it, it, there's not enough tubing that allows them to kangaroo care. 
So they might be prevented on how soon they can kangaroo care if they have that in place. But that just becomes more of a daily discussion about do we need the UAC? Are we using it enough to, to warrant having this and preventing the kangaroo care? As long as our lines are secured and we're able to bridge them, we do still promote kangaroo care. And there isn't restrictions as far as humidity. You just want to make sure that the room temp's warm and that everything else in the environment is going to allow for the baby to stay with a, a stable temperature. We, we just finished an EBP project on how to increase our kangaroo care. And so our new mantra is as early as often and as long as possible. Yeah, we are starting them like as soon as possible. And humidity, we haven't had a problem with taking them out of humidity. I think the mother and the blanket over them provides enough humidity for them. Yeah, I know Malafi was on here earlier and she did a talk for us a few months back about um, ba getting babies out of the box. Yeah. Carolyn, you might, you, I don't know if you saw that one, but you I might want to go back. There. Yeah, I would highly recommend it. It was an excellent lecture. I think I did see it. It sounds familiar to me. Yeah, it was the, oh, they presented it at Graven this year. And then, so then they came after Graven and presented it here. So I have a question. We're in the process of improving our kangaroo processes. And we've gone through several iterations trying to help. We actually use the hummingbird, the mm -hmm. oscillator, rather than jet in our unit, but it restricts us some. So some of the things that we've done, uh, we've changed the way we set up our bedsides to where the ventilators and the baby's head is at the opposite side of the isolate, if that makes sense. Mm. So all of our equipment is at the, at, instead of the wall, it's up toward the center. And so when we are able to have mom kangaroo with babies that are on oscillators, there's no disconnection of the surface mm -hmm. and it's an easier uh, process. It's still tenuous, of course, uh, because of the situation, but it's improving for those particular babies. So I just wanted to know if you all had something to share that would help in that process. Just to clarify, you're using not the jet and you're not using the regular, the high frequency. Yes. Next. Okay. Yeah. I don't know, Janet, you probably could speak to that, the setup that you guys have done at Loma Linda for years. I think it's just a matter of a lot of hands and positioning the baby so that the jet is straight on with it. We've gotten so good at it. I, now I don't remember the transition period that we had, but it was difficult. But I see them doing that all the time and it doesn't seem to be a problem anymore as long as the mom and the baby are in the correct position. And usually that means that the baby is side lying on the mom's chest, not so much stomach Robbed. to stomach. So. I agree. Do you have any special chairs or any of that can lift mom to the proper level since we can't adjust the oscillator's height? Uh, no. Back in the old days, we used to have to lift the oscillator up, and now it's just at the level of the isolate, so we, we're not having to put that up on stilts or whatever it was that they mm -hmm. used to do. Um, it seems to me like the tubing is more flexible now, so mm -hmm. I don't know if you also have that yeah. same sort of tubing, but it hasn't been a problem with the moms. They just sit in a regular rocker chair, so no, nothing special. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, I was thinking when I still was working there years ago, we would put the high frequency was always, or a lot of times at the foot of the bed, Jackie, like you were saying. And then of course the Omni beds being able to pop open, we were able to even move it if we needed to without disconnect. So I think that made a big difference too. But I do remember a lot, we used to put it at the foot of the bed. Yeah, we still, we have it at the foot of the bed with the baby position where the head would be at where the feet usually are. Mm -hmm. so. Um, interesting thing about when we started this process, um, all of our babies in the small baby unit now have their equipment and everything positioned that way. Mm. And it's carrying over when we transition. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't, know, I don't know why we always thought everything has to be like slammed against the wall, but right. yeah. It makes it easier for the mom to sit without yeah. everything there. So it gives her some space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I had a question about your steps process, Deidre. When you talk about thermal regulation, could you give me a little bit more information about that? Because we're having some variations with issues 
during procedures and that kind of thing, even though we're using our plastic drapes and everything, and getting them back to neutral thermal, even with the Omni beds. So we're trying to do a QI project on that. It's just starting. Is there something that you've found, some special fairy dust that can make it easier? <laughs> I wish, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, I think the one thing that we struggle with sometimes is keeping the hearts on the babies, yeah. especially if they have a lot of skin integrity issues or if it's just very immature that it won't stick to it. I think that's our biggest issue is just making sure everybody's very aware of checking that frequently, especially during long procedures. And if you have to do axil axillary temps during that, to making sure that we are doing that and, and following it very closely. If they need them every 15 minutes, then that's what they need to make sure that we're not overheating or under providing them heat. And on your temp probe area, where are you placing that consistently on the babies? I know this sounds like a funny question, but with some of the new products, axillary is where they've recommended us use those. And that has become a standard in our unit. I wondered if you were doing the same or are you utilizing the abdominal area? For the most part, it's still on the upper abdominal quadrants. If we do have issues there, then we start looking for the axilla or sometimes even the back, wherever we can get a consistent read. There's downfalls to having it always in the axilla. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and skin breakdown is one of those problems. So we watch it quite carefully, but thank you. Does everybody Good. use the gold hearts or are there other products that you guys are familiar with? And we're do you using, have good experiences with them? We're using the very thin gold hearts mm -hmm. consistently. With the hydrogel. Okay. Right. Which always, they always goo off frequently, but I had a baby just last weekend, really small, that was just really cold all the time and they had the temperature probe under the arm and mm -hmm. as soon as we moved it to the abdomen the bed was able to regulate the baby a lot better yeah i feel like the abdomen just seems to be a better place for those really small babies yeah it's yeah. always been a difficult thing for me because that's where all the brown fat is that's what we were right about. yeah and suddenly everybody thinks it's a better place to be under the axle but yeah, we got new giraffes about a year ago i think and the rep told us to put the probe under the axilla and everybody was freaking out. What? We were told never to do that. We were always told to put it in a place mm -hmm. and not have it covered. And so Absolutely. we haven't gone to that practice. I have the same questions, even though it's part of our practice. I'm still not a fan. Uh, not at all. I'm actually a big fan of the axillary temp probe. I find it's a little bit more accurate, um, especially if you're keeping your kid in the bundle where their arms are flexed up against their body. Whenever it's on the abdomen, it just seems like too many factors. The next thing you're playing Russian roulette with the temp control and you're setting it for 36. And then all of a sudden the isolate says, oh, you want 36 and they give you 36. At least the axillary seems like a consistent temp. Janet, when you had that kid that had an issue, so you had the skin probe and then you were taking manual axillaries and it was just not correlating? Yeah, so we were having to go way up on the humidity and the bed was just really hot and then the kid was too hot and so it just mm -hmm. was not regulating at all and then the kid got really cold as soon as we okay. moved it I like to put it on the sides so that when they do side to side positioning then they can always so they're, they're not laying on the temperature probe so if mm -hmm. they have two probes on but it sounds like we need some research on this yeah again a lot <laughs> more research. Everywhere. And then I see Barb said something about brown fat and tiny babies, and I agree. I'm just making a general statement about that. So. Those questions, is, is anybody still using Aquaphor? Yes. What were the times you go for that, Carolyn? I feel like I always tell people I'd like Aquaphor on the preemies and Eucerin on the big fat babies. I don't know why. I think it's because Eucerin seems harder to spread on, and I feel like I'm moving their skin around too much and maybe mm -hmm. detaching fibrils or something, but that's not really evidence-based. But I think one thing that everybody always thought was you couldn't use Aquaphor if you were under phototherapy. I think that's an old wives' tale. I see a lot of babies that they just look ashy, and so we tend to use Aquaphor for them. 
And then somebody asked a question about chemical mattresses. Is that part of your practice or anybody else? In the delivery room. Yeah. So use them in the delivery room and then you keep them underneath them, like during that kind of line placement, that first couple hours? We actually no? have a whole guideline on, I think it's 99. If they're 99, we take it out. If it's less than 99, we leave it under them. There's a protocol we mm -hmm. have from coming from the delivery room down to the NICU. And then while they're stabilizing in the NICU, when do you use it? When do you take it out? And then sometimes we use it for if a baby gets cold at some point later on and we use it to help rewarm them a little bit. Yeah. And then Deidre or anybody else, are you guys actually taking your baby's admission bed for the NICU with you to the delivery room and swapping out and doing their initial admission right on their NICU bed and then closing up and shuttling them back? Or are you doing um, bed transfers? So for us, we're doing bed transfers. We have warmer tables in the rooms down in delivery, in the delivery unit, and then we go through a transfer isolate up to the fourth floor, and then we admit them onto their regular bed. And we'll use the chemical mattress for the transfer if we need to, as well as for warming up if we have a hypothermic baby as well. Mm -hmm. Most of our babies are outborn. We do have a field health center. And we do have a shuttle that takes the isolate back and forth. The difficulty with having outborn, our transport team takes all of the protocol pieces with them and they are transported with the chemical mattress, but that transfer is still an issue. And downfall for Z flows, if they're not pre warmed appropriately, they are not useful. We have to do it all right. So some of the problems we've had with our link transfers, they just haven't pre-done their work well. And the babies are chilly when they come back to us. So. We're at the top of the hour. And I just want to say thank you again, Deidre, for just all your leadership in this and getting your whole team involved. And I know it was a big project that had those challenges that you talked about, but I think you've really done a nice job. So great work. And just thanks for sharing all that you've been doing and all of you for joining today. It was really fun to be with all of you. All right, that wraps up week three of our IVH prevention and care series. If you haven't watched the others, go ahead and click the links in the show notes below to get access to those videos and other resources that we have. You can also scan the QR code here on the screen. It'll take you to a resource page where you enter your name and email, and then we'll send you reminders when new videos come up. So I hope that you've enjoyed this presentation, have some new ideas. I, I love this framework. It's so simple and so easy, and it's easy for any of us to be able to implement in our Nikki to have discussions about quality improvement. Which of these five steps do you need to do better in? Which ones can really move the needle for your rates of IVH? I did speak to Deidre and they are still continuing on with their STEPS program and moving forward with the goal as all of us are reducing the rate of IVH in our NICUs. So I hope that you've enjoyed it. And if you're watching this the week of Thanksgiving, have a great Thanksgiving. And I will see you next week for week four with Lauren Heimel, who will be talking to us about post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button. It really helps us out a lot. It tells YouTube you like videos like this and helps us to share our videos with more people. So go to our YouTube channel, hit that like and subscribe button. If you want to get some of the other resources, go ahead and click the link in the show notes below or scan the QR code right here on the screen. So don't miss out on week four coming up next Monday on November 27th, I think is the date. So anyways, I'll see you next time and have a